Welcome to the science, Bioelectrical Science Society. Uh, I will be your moderator for tonight. Um, in order to provide you with um, better information about our group, uh, you can uh, check our, our website in, in, in uh, 2011. That is composed uh, by UMass uh, graduate um, doctoral, doctoral students. We uh, invite every monitor um, audience to share information on new developments in science. Uh, today we'll be talking about the um, biological um, evolutive biology, the National uh, Foundation for Science, and the Protectorate for the Arts. You can subscribe uh, via email and uh, keep track of our activities. We're starting with the Hybrid Cafe. We have both an online and in-person event. In order to make our events more accessible to all the audio, all the audiences. If you have an idea or suggestion in order to make our events more accessible, just let us know. We have the SACNAS organization. There is a, in charge of promoting a, a Hispanics, a Native Americans, and Chicanos to obtain the careers in sciences, technology, and mathematics. I'm going to present our speaker today, Dr. 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 Ana Quisedo. She studied biology at the University of the Andes. Then she obtained a, a doctoral degree in the Washington and also a postdoctoral in the University of North Carolina. Since 2006, she's been a um, professor at the biology department at UMass Amherst. And today she's here to tell us about her, her advancements in research on a weeds. What is a weed and where does it come from? Well, Carl, thank you so much in the first place for having me. That's a great question and a little bit complicated. A weed plant is basically a, a plant that grows where, wherever we don't want it to. Most of the people are acquainted, familiarized with uh, several plants that grow in our garden so we call it a weed. But this goes beyond that. This can be a very a pretty subjective uh, definition. Because what if I have a plant that I like it um, and it comes there like uh, without me planting it? Is that a weed or? So basically I work with um, agricultural weeds. And there we have a more technical definition, more objective, less objective. Um, for example, in agricultural fields, you, you have a crop and you have one plant, one single one, that has not been planted yet or is growing. That by itself, it's a weed. Let's talk about a little bit more uh, of um, domestication. How does this uh, entangle? What does it have to do with uh, weed? Let's think about in agricultural um, environment. We have three types of uh, plants. Number one, in the agricultural country. I have some uh, slides that I would like to share with you so I can explain myself uh, a little easier. Can I control the slides? That's the one I want. Very well. Thank you. Well, when you see here, three, it is uh, three types of uh, plants. We have wild plants. These are plants that grow in the wild, and some of them we have used to, we have profited from them. We take them and we incorporate it to our agricultural system. We have domesticated crops. The, those are the ones that we have purposefully taken into the agricultural system. And then we have the um, agricultural wheat. There are invasive uh, species that invade uh, crops. So the relation among, uh, among this uh, is built in agricultural terms. This uh, has a evaluative feature, an evaluative nature, um, because for example, a weed can generate from crops and there can be a hybridization from that. So your question was about uh, domestication. I would say 
Mm, uh, we can leave that for a little later. Uh, we can just talk about the domesticated plant. These are the ones that we have transformed to serve a purpose, a, a purpose for us. We have taken wild plants, we have applied what we know, artificial selection, and we have created, we have came up with plants with particular features that we are interested in. For example, larger fruit, sweeter plants, um, plants with a better yield. All this has been done through domestication. So we plants are plants that we have not transformed, that we have not integrated to the agri agricultural environment. So how long the, has this been happening? Wow, that's a huge question. It is believed that we humans have started to do this process for a long, about 10,000 or 12,000 years. It's a continuously evolved process. Plants domesticated with plants take a long process for this to happen. Is there any competence we, that we can understand between the wheat plants and the domesticated cultivars? Indeed, that is the big problem uh, and they, they, that, that's the jeopardy this uh, weed, uh, weeds bring to humans. So uh, let's take a look at this slide. You can see here some of the problems that weeds bring to the agricultural, uh, to the agricultural, agricultural soil. So we have domesticated plants for 500, 1,000 years, say. So we have created, an, we have modified the environment to create an agricultural uh, environment. So other plants seek to take advantage of that. They seek to integrate the plants, what we formally call the weeds, have been with us forever, 1,000, 12,000 years. So the archaeology, let us know that always we have we, we can see re, 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 remains of weeds. So they have been bugging us forever for a very long time. So what they do is that they come, they integrate in the culture, and they start a competence for resources, water, uh, nutrients, soil, light, you name it. Basically, they are in a struggle for all the resources that the plant the, the agricultural plant can use. So the yielding of the product is going to be less, is going to be lessened. So you have a loss in productivity. And this is very serious. This is big consequences. Weeds are one of the most important causes for the loss in agricultural yield. And what this means is that we are losing food because of uh, weeds this, the yieldings could be larger, but we're losing them. So humans, they need to use a larger portions of soil in order to meet the, the food demand. And when this uh, is a need, uh, that means that we have to, we need to have a stronger affectation, a stronger impact over land. So conservation uh, get, gets uh, pressured. Uh, so weeds uh, create or are meant to create uh, an, uh, an environmental crisis to, to contribute. So uh, what is the question again? Uh, how can we study the evolution of a uh, weed? Well, there are several ways in which we can do this. In my lab, what we have mostly done is uh, by uh, genetic tools and mechanisms. We're trying to understand how, through the time, um, this weeds have been changing genetically. And what is genetics, you will ask? Basically, this is the study of how features are inherited and passed on across generations. So every single living thing has a DNA, which is a, material, a genetic material. It's basically a chain of nucleotides that brings the instructions 
of uh, how to assemble, if you can put it like that, a, 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 um, a being, a living thing. So genetics status is interested in knowing, finding out what, what are the traits in passing on this generation after generation. Mm, but what can the DNA tell us about uh, wheat? Well, by studying it, we can discover what are the oldest or the, the evolution on the, from this uh, wheat. What are the ancestors of this uh, plant? By studying DNA, we can also identify which are the genes controlling very specific traits that bring uh, this powerful and robust uh, feature to uh, wheat to make it to survive, cause it to survive. So there you come uh, with the question, what is, what is the gen? The gen is, um, let's say, we have the DNA and we can see the chain of the DNA, they're in males of large uh, chains, very long. So all together, all these nucleotides belong into one cell. That's what we call the genome. So one gen, it's a tiny bit, it's the unit, the smallest unit of those nucleotides. So that tiny bit codifies, brings instructions within of how to assemble a particular feature, uh, the substitution, the placing of a protein, a DNA chain, and so on. So how do we go about a genetic um, analysis? Well, there are plenty of ways. Actually, in particular, it depends on the question you're formulating. Depending on the question, you have a method to, do, to, to get to it. If you want to study DNA, you collect a plant, you remove tissue, for example, a lead, and you ground and open the, 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 the cells, and that causes, by the use of some chemicals, the extraction of DNA. And then it comes sequencing. There are very sophisticated and incredible machines that helps to create, to, to carry out DNA sequencing. So we can find out what is contained inside. And once we get this information, it is not easily obtained, we can start comparison across different types of plants and see what are the relations among those features. This could be a one way, broadly speaking. Uh, tell us a little bit the, the, the background of your investigation. How do these plants get to become a weed? But uh, let me ask our audience uh, and find out if they have any questions. If you have uh, questions over Zoom, feel free to send our, your question. Question, so I can uh, rephrase it for. So she was asking, what are the most common types of wheat in agricultural fields as in maize or different, or more the most common types of uh, crops? There are plenty. That's a very broad question because wheat happen, they come up, they raise in different uh, crops, but there, are in, 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 there is an infinite uh, number of plants that actually may become the uh, wheat more than 8,000 in agricultural, agricultural field. You have 250 that are the most, the, the, the key ones, but still is a large group. So it totally depends on the type of crop. You wanted to, you wanted to know about specifically maize, corn? I, I don't have a, a lot of experience in the, this agricultural crop, so I couldn't tell very specifically.
if you have domesticated plants, how do those domesticated plants become weeds? Did you say genetically? Okay, genetically domesticated. So talking about plants that are uh, genetically uh, domesticated, they can become weeds or not. People who work in plant modifications and to create uh, genetically modified cultures or harvests, they are creating uh, plants that are, for instance, more resistant to bugs and insects or that are more resistant to pesticides. But we're not considering a very important thing is that we are cultivating, we are harvesting those plants uh, in an environment where, our, where uh, the land is prone to growing weeds. So they can kind of mix with those weeds or plants that were already there. So we have to create uh, cultures that are domestic, genetically domesticated that cannot mix with other uh, familiar crops because, because of that hybridization that a uh, modified gene could go into the weeds and create a new uh, weed that's resistant to pesticides. So that's a very uh, important issue. Another question? I wasn't here when uh, it started. He's apologizing for being here late. What's the chlorophyll of a plant? It's a, it's basically a molecule that plants have that they use to uh, get the sun's energy. So these molecules give the plants the green color that they have and they use the energy from the sun to do photosynthesis and they produce uh, sugars and glucose. We're going into the second part. What's your uh, lab's focus? I am interested in how plants uh, adapt to an agricultural environment both weeds and domesticated plants, but weeds uh, are so successful in adapting to new environments. So my main focus is in these weedy plants. It's not the only one uh, that we study, but we do, it's my favorite is uh, the weedy rice or wheat rice. And what is it and why it, does it interest you? It's a rice, a type of rice that uh, behaves as a weed. I have another slide to show you how this uh, weedy rice looks like. It's a type of rice that behaves as a weed and invades the harvests of cultivated rice. And this happens in the whole world. So everywhere in the world where people are growing rice, we are going to find this weed. And we grow rice in many parts of the world. It's very uh, closely related to the uh, cultivated rice and it causes problems like it uh, lessens the productivity. And it looks so much like the, uh, like the cultivated rice. So you can see here a field. This is a cultivated rice field here in the United States. And the darker parts is the cultivated uh, rice. And if you can see, there are a few patches that look lighter. So that's the weedy rice. So that's an example of how invasive uh, the weedy rice can be. 
Another picture I wanted to show you is that uh, the there are some shellings. Those are the grains, and it looks like that red. So because it looks red, uh, a lot of people call it red rice. And then you're asking me why, and why do we want to study the wheaty rice? We study this rice because I feel uh, it's I feel it's a very uh, it's a wheat that has a very big impact in the world in a worldwide agriculture, and it's uh, and the rice it's the first uh, one of the it's the first uh, means of it's a it's one of the main uh, diets for more than half of the world. What are the questions or issues uh, that you want to understand with your study of with the wheat rice? We want to understand how these wheat rice. I we want to see what the origins have been in each part of the world. We are also interested in understanding what are the characteristics that the wheat rice. Uh, is so successful in cultivated fields, and we want to try to control the genes that help this wheaty rice uh, be this successful. And how do you how do you do your investigation? We uh, do our investigation using the same tools we already mentioned. We collect wheaty rice from different parts of the world. We extract the DNA and we use that DNA and compare it with uh, wild rice, with cultivated rice, and we try to understand where the wheaty rice has come from. And then we also compare the wheaty rice with the cultivated rice to see, to see the key characteristics of the wheat rice that helps it be so successful. We also try to mix uh, the wheat rice with the cultivated rice to see which are the genes that control uh, these characteristics. Uh, for what can I see, the investigation has been very extensive. Do you work with somebody else? Yes, so I think the next slide is to show you and give you an idea. I mentioned that the witty rice grows in everywhere in the world. I haven't studied all of the countries in the world, but these are an ex this is an example of collaborators that I've had in the past years to kind of understand the origins of the witty rice. So this is a very collaborative uh, work. I need to work with other people in different uh, parts of the world. And what have you learned uh, with your studies? I have an, uh, another slide. We've discovered things that for me are very interesting. The main one or the main discovery we've made is that the witty rice in different parts of the world has evolved independently, which uh, means that if we look at the witty rice in Spain, this has an independent origin uh, with the witty rice in Colombia and in India and an independent uh, genes from the wheat rice in the USA. So the wheat rice has evolved many, many times. Another thing we've discovered is that the wheat rice most times has evolved from domesticated uh, ancestors. So what I wanted to show in this graph is that we have the wide 
the wild rice, which is uh, the ancestor for the agriculture from the domesticated rice. And then we have different types of rice that are harvested. And then from that cultivated or harvested rice, domesticated, the wheat rice has come from. So the evolution of the wheaty rice has come from a domesticated harvest. What has happened is that we have a harvest that or a culture that has uh, characteristics that we like. So we've had, uh, so, but then, so we've domesticated the rice to have characteristics we like, and then the weed has grown from that and become a rice that we don't like. The weed uh, have been very problematic to agriculture since uh, humans have started uh, harvesting the land. So it's been thousands and thousands of years that we had to deal with weed. One are monocultures. When we see the same culture, the same year, and then the next, and then the next, we create we create a very stable situation so and that this enables the weedy plants to uh, adapt uh, it's harder for weeds to adapt when there's a, a harvest rotations and then when we mix harvests as well when we have two different harvests in one field another practice that we have uh, that we are using more pesticides and we are creating a selection for weeds that are uh, resistant to these pesticides. So your lab uh, still continues to investigate weeds. Yes, we still have a lot of questions that we want to answer about weeds. Uh, I can give you some uh, examples in the next slide. Because I had mentioned that we are very interested, uh, interested to uh, to know uh, what are the characteristics that make weeds uh, so successful. I think one of the most important is the presence of what we call shelling. When we have a weed, when that's what what we call shelling is that when the plant grows the seeds uh, fall to the ground by itself. Uh, and what happens with domesticated harvests, uh, that doesn't happen because men wanted, wanted that to happen like that. Humans have selected during the domestication so to lose that shelling. But when this wheat plant evolved, it evolved again to this shelling. And one of the things that we're trying to understand in our lab is how that happens. How does this shelling evolve and what are the genes responsible for this? So we are trying to understand, to understand what the genes were involved in this domestication of the shelling and how uh, the weed evolved and what genes were affected to provoke the shelling again. So are, is this evol evolution the same in Spain and Colombia or different? We also study other weeds. We are interested in weeds that happen in cranberries. I don't know how to say cranberries in Spanish. It's not arandanos.
in weeds that happen in lentils that are different from the ones that we are used to, but uh, that resemble their lentils that we know. And we also are studying the domestication of tomatoes. We have another time to answer questions from the public. I have two questions. Good night, good evening. When you mention weedy rice, you're talking about a rice that you eat or is it a plant that you can't eat? Is it a type of uh, rice that's wild or is it In science, we which we use because sometimes one thing can be uh, interpreted and misinterpreted. When we use the word "wild," uh, we talk about uh, crops, plants that grow outside of the field, outside of the agricultural soil, and therefore we are not working with that. Wild rice is not uh, weed rice is not wild. Interestingly, it, it only grows uh, when we are growing rice. But it's genetically uh, very close to the rice we know, with the rice we consume. But we don't eat it, though, because the seeds of this weed the rice uh, fall off. They can be actually pollutants of the harvest. Actually, we normally, the, the, the overall rice, the, the common rice, it has a little bit, it contains a little bit of that. But normally these seeds tend to escape. We can eat it, it, can be, it, it is edible. They're so closely related that uh, the taste is not even different. Another question, I'm from Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, we have a lot of problems with, for example, Monsanto. I, in, in Puerto Rico, actually, we had this legal affair battle. She comes from Puerto Rico, and we had a struggle, a legal struggle with Monsanto. I don't know if you know, if you've heard of that. So if you know anything about it, eh, what would you tell us? Well, I wouldn't know what to say. I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit more on that. Well, I was here. I was there in Puerto Rico when they had this project consisting on the uh, herbicides, they are uh, a pesticide the company worldwide. And they effective, they negatively effective the, the, the livelihood of a lot of people there. And they brought uh, the, the, the chemicals they released in the ambient uh, damage the livelihood of many people. And then we saw a legal struggle. There is no obviously, obviously the media transcendence over the United States because they want to keep that secret. But you as a professional, uh, in terms of the agronomical sciences, and you as a professional, what would you like? I mean, do you have anything to tell us about that? Simply put, Monsanto was a struggle between uh, Puerto Rico and the uh, this company that was releasing herbicides to uh, the crops and uh, this one it turned out to be very damaging for uh, the community's health. So her question is, uh, what is the relation between Monsanto and um, the, the, the proliferation of weed? Are they generated from uh, prior crops crops that haven't have been uh, harvested and created before. Do you have any uh, knowledge uh, about that? Well, uh, my knowledge is limited, I have to admit. Uh, I would say herbicides are chemical and chemicals, they have often terrible side effects 
So the less chemistry we use into uh, crops, there's a lot of interest that actually um, that they are seeking for alternative um, ways of handling um, weeds and pests. The use and the overuse of these uh, herbicides, uh, they be, 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 be beyond the health problems that they bring to the human um, have a direct impact on the resistance the weed may have toward that. So there are many, there are lots of herbicides, but there are also alternative ways that we need to find to, to better control those if we want to succeed with that. Has there been any opportunity in which the weed arise takes over control takes over the structure, uh, the agricultural st structure, and uh, that we end up uh, actually eating those uh, grains of rice? Is that, is that, do, you, do you think, I mean, is that thinkable as a possibility? That is a very interesting question. And many places around the world, you see fields in which uh, farmers uh, grow um, cultivated rice, but at some point they have so infested of this weedy rice that they had to quit it, they had to leave it behind. And one of the most important features of this uh, wheat rice is that the grain is huge. And another feature is that it has the dormancy, the seed dormancy, which means that the seeds fell off the tree after shedding, they remained in the soil, and they can remain there for ages, entire year, just waiting for the best conditions to grow. So you can have a field in which you have uh, many um, seeds and they grow this year, the other ones will come next year and so on and so on. So you will see that uh, an entire field can grow to the extent that the farmer has so limited uh, amount of uh, edible rice or uh, crop rice is that, that, that they have to leave it behind. So that normally ends with a change of um, crops in the lookout for other um, crops that sustain and they are not suffer from the problem of um, weedy rice. The question is, the effect of this weed can be associated with, from, with, can be associated with seeds or another side uh, grown uh, related to the plant itself, or it's basically the seed would bring the problem. What I'm understanding from this question is, uh, where does infestation come from? Like the, the very first infestation of the field. I, that's what I'm sensing in that question, is right? So both uh, those explanations are plausible. Rice, uh, with, with the rice, back in the day, someone just uh, grew uh, regular rice, and the seeds have been dormant there for many years. And then I'm not, and someone else just uh, decides to grow um, regular rice, and boom, um, with the rice grows up. But we can also have the, the phenomenon that you want to grow rice for the first time, so you purchase regular rice. And this it happens to be polluted uh, in, a, in a combination of um, weedy rice. And actually, this is more common than we can think. Not in, in wealthier countries with, uh, like the United States, uh, that you can, where, you can, where you find uh, farmers with the ability to purchase a, high quality seeds, but they think of the case of Colombia. Farmers exchange seeds. And as long as that happens, 
this uh, harvest gets polluted, gets a contaminant from this weedy rice. And therefore, you, you, have, uh, you find yourself growing both without knowing it. So let's move on to part three. Beyond the, the extent of uh, your research, you, have, you, you seem to have an outreach role as well. Uh, they, they're in the lookout to create um, a, a more academic and extensive role. You are one of the co-founders of uh, La Mente Boya. It's a blog that has been written for again, academics that are deaf and we hard of hearing. Uh, but tell us a little bit about that. Why did you decide to start this uh, undertaking? Let me give you a little context before I go straight to the point. Uh, let me see the next uh, slide, please. Would you like? Yeah. Mm. What I want to display here is something that you may not know. And is that disabilities in the farming uh, population are quite common. 26% of adults in the United States have any form of um, dis disability. But overall population, for example, when you go to university, you discover that only 4% of the um, staff and alum, um, students have um, disabilities. So what we see is a huge problem of mass representation here, basically because um, we have many, uh, a, a mass representation and underrepresentation of um, persons with disabilities. Mm, and this is due, we believe, because the support, mechani support mechanism are not there as a, a person grows in their career. So there are no um, scaffolding system for university students uh, with disabilities. But what we see is that as we uh, progress, they lessen and lessen and lessen until they become new. Uh, let me see the next one, would you? Look at this. I have a disability. I have a um, slight um, audi uh, um, audition and loses. I depend a lot of my, uh, um, my um, I depend a lot on my uh, headset. And that's why um, you have, you, you have, we have needed a repetition from you every time we, we have a new question from the audience. So I, but, but I happen to be faculty. I am a university teacher, professor. So I've had the experience of this um, lack of, of support for people like me. When you reach a certain state, uh, as you progress, um, scaffolding lessons and lessons more and more. So in this graph, what you can see is how people that are hard of hearing, um, you can see how the more, the, the higher educative level we have, the less we progress to the following step. And the next thing is that this disability, the one I have, it's not new at all. It's everywhere. We have a 14% of adults with this type of disability and working age. They're losing their hearing. But we are, but again, it turns out that we are misrepresented. Let me see the next one, please. The next um, slide. Will you? Thank you. Okay, so this is our blog. The mind hears, the escuchas con la mente, the mind hears. So this blog, we started with, with, uh, with a colleague, Michelle Cook. She was from the Department of the Geosciences. And she, uh, just as me, uh, is, has a tendency to lose hearing. And we were talking about the difficulties, so we decided that we could create something. Uh, and we have this objective, to diminish the um, isolation so we decided that it was time to create a network of uh, deaf academics. People like us to understand 
able to understand uh, what goes on, what goes on with uh, our lives for deaf and hard of hearing uh, professionals, academics. And the next one is uh, mutual support. So we're looking to share experiences and strategies to, that we have used to overcome our professional challenges. So how does it look? The way we have um, overcome this and see how we can create new ways to uh, overcome this. celebrating uh, diversity in STEM and it has many chapters around the country and a lot of activities to uh, try to support uh, people in minority groups that are interested in having a career in these areas. I, I know, know you. you have uh, experience in SACNAS. Talking a little bit about me, I'm a student that was just transferred uh, from Western Massachusetts and I have now transferred to uh, finish my bachelor's degree in industrial engineering. So my first semester is being in UMass Amherst. I did my first semester, so I don't have a lot to say. I haven't participated a lot but SAGNES is a, an organization that I liked uh, since the beginning uh, because it not only helps a lot of people, it allows, it also promotes uh, to, it also promotes people knowing uh, people from other countries. I know it is a society and I know not all communities uh, offer that. His conference was in Puerto Rico this year. So that was very important to me. So I am uh, rooting for all of Latin people to go far. The first one is look for a community of people that understands what are the difficulties you have and that helps you celebrate good things as well. I think that uh, something that has become easier these days because of social media, but uh, first of all, look for a community, search for a community. This is something I would tell myself if I could go back in time. Another thing I would say is that you have to persevere. A career in science is uh, very often very hard. Like all, all, all careers are hard, but uh, there will be hard times. And this is more true for people that have disabilities, but for those that don't as well. Uh, and then you have to keep going. And the last thing I would say is that you have to be flexible and creative. Yes, uh, having a hearing loss is going to present difficulties. It's going to create uh, barriers, but don't take this as something that has to 
are going to cut your road. Uh, just be flexible. Uh, if things uh, don't work one way, just try a different and go on. So thank you very much for sharing uh, what you do. Now we have another chance to some uh, questions from the public. From the audience. Where do you see yourself in five years from now with your investigation in weedy plants? What do you think might happen? I hope that in five years, we are able to finally identify uh, what, uh, what's producing uh, or what gene is enabling the shelling in the weedy rice. Uh, we are still not there, but I would like to identify that gene would be very interesting uh, in a if, in a evolutionary point of view. I don't know if this is interesting for you, but this is very interesting for me is that the shelling one uh, when one creates a cultivated grain, one does not want the grain to fall by itself. But the, it doesn't want one doesn't want it to be hard uh, to peel it either. So if we can find identify the gene that controls the shelling, this can also help us create harvests. Uh, we can fine tune the level of the shelling to facilitate the harvests. It would be something very useful on a uh, agricultural point of view. And I think I'll be here in UMass working with uh, Witty Rice here uh, in five years. Uh, thanks for joining us in our final life science event of the year. We will start again in February. And we will start the 2023 20, with a cell biology panel where we will be invited, uh, inviting three cell biologists to tell us all how um, to know about cells, how cells move. This will be in English. And if you would like some more information, we have a website. And besides that, please don't forget to complete our registration forms so that we can uh, keep offering events uh, about events about themes you would like to know more about. We will be also organizing events for uh, members of our community that have hearing loss. We want to uh, thank we want to thank everyone that was here and thank Dr. Um, as well. <laughs>